Hello lovely people. Today Dr. Mesa Otabo talks about how to excel in our work. Remember to watch till the end. Keep watching. Excelling in our work. Excelling in our work. We have uh, quoted Proverbs 22, 29 often uh, this year. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Excelling in our work. For us, for us to excel in our work, we, we, our attitude to work must be right. Because if we have a wrong attitude to work, we cannot excel in it. There are people who see work as a curse. And so if you see work as a curse, you will not work wholeheartedly. If we see work as a blessing, we will have a more positive approach towards work. So what is it? Is work a curse or a blessing? Is hard work a curse or a blessing? And that is what I'm going to address in the next 40 or so minutes uh, and bring some understanding on the subject of work. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3 is my opening text. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which he had created and made. If you take note of the passage we read, the word work occurs three times, twice in verse 2 and once in verse 3. God ended his work, God rested from his work, and God rested from his work in verse 3. So the first statement I want to make is that God works. God works. We see that from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is God's own self-introduction. God could have introduced himself as sitting on a throne in heaven with angels worshiping him. He could have introduced himself in any form or shape. But he introduces himself right from the opening pages of the Bible as a worker. Yes, he is Lord, he is master, he is judge, he is ruler, but he is also a worker. God works. And if you take note of the word work, wherever they appear in the, in the passage we read, it is always preceded by a pronoun. His. So in verse 2 it says God ended his work. God rested from his work. Verse 3, and he rested from all his work. Anytime work is mentioned, it is not just work in, in general, but God's personal work. So work is important, but work is always personal to us. My work is not your work, and your work is not my work. Everybody has his or her work. God rested from his work. God works. He personalizes work. So what is work? What is work? This is my definition. Work is an activity that requires spiritual, mental, and physical effort. It's an activity that requires spiritual, mental, physical effort. It includes planning and execution of a project. Work always requires energy. 
It requires effort. It requires an exertion of force. In other words, you cannot be passive and work at the same time. You remember Newton's law. We cannot be passive and work at the same time. When we are passive, things will remain as they are. For things to move and to change, there has to be energy. Energy is what is required for work to take place. And each one of us, if we want to work, must use energy. Some force must be expended. So let me give you three dimensions of work. First, work is creation. When we work, we are creating something. It's an, a creation is an activity that leads to a finished product. God made things. He created things. That was work. He created finished products, trees, animals, human beings, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the mountains, the rivers. These are finished products. God made them. It is an aspect of work. Anytime we work, we are making something. If you take note of verse 2 of Genesis chapter 2, it says, God ended all his work which he had done. Work done. He ended the work he had done. Done. Not work he dreamt about or work he hoped to do, but work which has been done. And then in verse 3 it says, he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Three words there, done, created, made. So when we are working, something must be done, something must be made, something must be created. Work brings about creation. It brings about something, it manufactures, it produces, it makes something get done, something get made, something get created. That's the first dimension of work. Second dimension of work is craftsmanship. Craftsmanship is an activity that requires skill. Work is not just doing something, but what we do requires skill. In other words, there should be some expertise something you are very good at in addition to what you are doing. Work is not just making things. It requires skill. Every work requires skill. Every work. We, we may not even think it, they require skill, but they require skill. There, there's some work that people do that seems like, oh, it's so easy, there's no effort. But when you, you find out, you realize there is some, there is some effort. For example, if you find a woman uh, selling her wares uh, in the streets of Accra, she's carrying uh, on uh, some form of a platter uh, some food. It could be bread, it could be granites, it could be uh, something, oranges or dakwa or... <laughs> When you live in Nima, you acquire some taste. <laughs> so, all right. So, so you, you see the woman carrying this and, and selling and saying, oh, orange or whatever, whatever. When you're passing by, you look like, what kind of work is that? It's, it's lazy work, but there is a lot of skill. First, being able to balance something on your head without it falling requires skill. And not only balance it on your head, but walk whilst it is on your head. And not only walk whilst it's on your head, but talk at the same time. Doing three things, walking, talking, carrying. And under extreme need, running and still keeping that thing on your head. That is called skill. All right? The, the woman is working, but that work doesn't just take place. There is skill. It's craftsmanship. And so for every work that people do, uh, whether they play football or they are barbers or they are dressmakers or they're, they're scientists or researchers or professors in the university, whatever work that they are doing requires skill. That is craftsmanship. Of course, skill is not always the same. 
There are low level skills and high level skills, but that's not what I'm dealing with. I'm just saying that every work must create something. Every work requires craftsmanship. And thirdly, every work is a commission or something we commit to. An activity that occupies our time and our attention. It's a creation, it's craftsmanship, it's a commission. If work was not a commission, you will not know when you have finished it. You will just be working, 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 and not know when you have finished working. For you to work and know when to start and when to finish, it doesn't just have to be creating something, doesn't just have to have a skill, it has to have a commitment, a commission. It, there has to be something definite you are committing your time and your effort to. So when you read, for example, that the Bible says that God finished the work that he was doing, how did he know he had finished? How did he know when he started? How did he know he had finished? In other words, he had a clear assignment. A clear assignment. He knew how to start the assignment and he knew when to finish the assignment. And when he finished, he had finished the commission. Work must have a certain commitment, a commission. And it is only after he had finished the commission that he rested. God did not rest when he was working. He only rested after he had finished the commission. That's a very important lesson to us because a lot of us start working and we rest. And we get tired. But God starts working from day one and continues working the evening and the morning, the evening and the morning, evening and morning until he finished what he had committed to the sixth day. And then the seventh day, he rested. But you know, it didn't say he stopped. He rested. He paused and continued. Because God has not stopped working. As a matter of fact, he's still at work in us. He's working out his purposes in our lives. So he's still working. So he created skillfully, by commission, and afterwards... He rested. Each one of us in our work must have these three components. There must be something we are doing, we must do it skillfully, and we must be definite about it so that we can know when to begin and when to end it. So, for example, I am here preaching, I am working. How many of you know you, you've just come to my office? Okay, you, you see me work. Somebody will say, well, pastor is preaching work. I thought it was just work talking. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Why is it working? Well, first for me to preach, this sermon didn't exist until I created it. This sermon didn't exist. The scriptures were there. The words were there, but nobody had put together a sermon like this ever before. I had to assemble material to create it. For me to do that, first, there was a spiritual effort, spiritual energy. How did I do that? I prayed about this message. I prayed about it. God, give me a word. God, speak to your people. Show me what to do. That's prayer, spiritual energy. Then, mental energy. I studied how can you know all these things? You study. I've read lots of books in this past week. I've read tons of commentaries. I've studied language patterns. I've studied culture. I've studied so much in relation to my message. That is mental work. So spiritual prayer, mental study, and then physical. What part of this is physical? Sitting down itself is physical. How many of you know sitting down is hard work? Oh, yeah. Some, some people think sitting down is no work. You know, that's why a lot of people can't sit to work. 
Some people start working, they sit down. After three minutes, they get up. They say they're going to relieve tension. They can't discipline themselves to sit in one place and study for one hour, two hours, three hours. Sitting down is hard work. Hard work. So I had to sit down. I had to type my message. Develop it in Word and put it in PowerPoint. That's hard work. Then after I have done all of that, I have to come and stand here for 45 minutes and talk. That's why I drink water sometimes when I'm preaching. It's work. Drink water. It's a lot of work. So there's spiritual effort, there's mental effort, there's physical effort. Just standing here and talking. I have my commission. Then I finish at a certain point. Do you know the most relaxed period of my life? When, when I'm the, the, the most restful. Do you know when? It's Sunday after second service, after you guys. <laughs> because from Monday, I start preparing my message. And I work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday, I come to fulfill the commission. So I preach first service. I'm half happy. Then I have to preach the second service. You, you guys. The crowd in the second service is very different from the crowd in the first service. So I have to always change my style of communication in the second service. It's part of my work. I look at your faces, I know when you understand, when you don't understand. <laughs> You're looking at me like that. I know I'm not, I'm not getting through, so I have to. I have to. I have to. It's my job. I'm walking up and down. I'm sweating big time. That's my work. Then when I finish all of this, I go back there and people want to see me after service and come to talk to me about problems and things and that and I have all the patients and listen. So somehow around 2.30, 3 o'clock when I have finished preaching and I have spoken to all the people who came to see me is the best time of the day for me. It is almost like God rested <laughs> from all the work which he has done. Then tomorrow morning it starts all over again. The same process, same process. You don't rest forever. You rest for a moment and go back to work. So you find work requires you create something. You must do it skillfully and you must treat it as a commission. Something that you can start and finish. So if you are a dressmaker and you can and you rest whilst you are working, you will disappoint people. Somebody said, Pastor, why did you talk about dressmakers? For obvious reasons. <laughs> you tell people, I mean, some, there's somebody, I can guarantee you, there's somebody sitting in church today who was disappointed by the seamstress. <laughs> There's somebody today. The seamstress disappointed you. That what you wanted to wear for church today didn't come. Because somebody rested. <laughs> somebody rested. Somebody rested while I was working. Whatever you are, whether you are a pastor, you are a dressmaker, you are a carpenter, you are an architect, you are a project manager, you are a lawyer, you are a doctor. You don't rest until the commission has been fulfilled. You don't rest. Because work is a commission. When somebody depends on you for something to be finished, you must finish it before you rest. You can't, in the middle of your work, stop everything and go for a funeral for three days. When your commission has not been fulfilled, it is 
not responsible, not responsible. When we work, we are creating something, it must be done skillfully, and we must do it as a commission. So the first point I have made is that God is a worker. But God is not the only worker. God created man to work. God created us to work. Did you know that? You thought you were created to be happy. <laughs> no, you were created to work. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Work. In fact, if you look at the sequence of events, God gave the man, took the man, put him in the garden, gave him a work. And then he said, you can eat everything that is in the garden. And then he says, I'll give you a wife. So, Work before you eat, before you marry. <laughs> that is God's sequence. Work, eat, marry. Now some of you marry, eat, and start looking for work. <laughs> no, <laughs> you work, you eat, you're able to take care of yourself, then you think of messing up somebody's life. <laughs> All right, so God created man to work. Adam's work in the garden was twofold. To tend, to tend means to cultivate, to work. To cultivate what God had given to him in Eden. God planted the garden of Eden. The trees in Eden were planted by God, but if they were going to be second trees, God was not going to plant them. Adam had to cultivate that. Adam had to take from what God had done and multiply them all over the world. God plants the first trees, but we plant the subsequent ones. That is tending. That is work. Requires planning. Requires physical labor. And then to keep the earth or to keep the garden of Eden means to preserve, to guard, to watch it, to maintain it. Weeds had to be man managed. So right in the garden of Eden, we see work. Work was required in Eden before the fall of man. Work is not something that came with the fall. Work started in Eden. Work is not a result of a curse. It is part of the blessing we have from God. It is a blessing to work. It is a blessing to work. Do you see a man who excels in work? How, how are you going to excel in your work if you think your work is a punishment? I remember when we were in school, I don't know why our teachers made work a punishment. You know, you, 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 you do something wrong, and they tell you, go and work on the school farm. As if working on the school farm is a punishment. Work is not a punishment. Work is a blessing. Work is not a curse. Work occurred in Eden, in God's original plan. Before Satan came in, he had determined that man should work. Then something happened in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and God had to address them. So, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 19 I'm just reading what God said to Adam because that is of direct reference to what I'm teaching. But he said something to the serpent, and I'm not going to read it because we are not serpents. Are you serpents? This is not for us. Then he says something to Eve. I will make reference to it, but I will not read it. But I will read what he said to Adam because it has uh, something to do about work. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. Then to Adam he said, 
because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you. Now, let me pause there. I, I always like to explain these things so people don't go and hurt themselves with the, with the scriptures. Now, don't look, read this and say, well, the Bible says God said Adam listened to the wife. That's why he went into trouble. So I'm a husband. I won't listen to my wife. Now, that's not what God is saying. God is saying, because you listen to the voice of your wife to eat of the fruit of which I said you should not eat. The sin was the eating of the fruit, not listening to the wife. The sin was eating the fruit. The, the only thing God is saying is that you ate the fruit because you listened to your wife. But there are many wives who, who give good advice to husbands. In fact, wives give better advice to their husbands than the men have themselves. Now, I'm looking at the men. They're looking at me and say, hey, pastor, 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 don't go there. Don't go there. I'm going there. Uh, listen to your wife. It will save you a lot of trouble. To save you a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. So she's always talking. She's always talking. She's always... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're always not listening. You're not listening. So she has to talk. Okay, let me go on. All right, so let me go back and read that verse. So then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it. All the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Till you return to the earth, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. I want you to note very importantly that Adam is not cursed. There's no statement in this passage to say Adam is cursed. The word curse is directed to the ground, not to Adam. Not to Adam. Adam is not cursed. Secondly, if you read the, what was said to Eve, Eve was not cursed. Eve was told she will still have children, but it will be multiplied pain. It will be more painful, but she will still have children. So what God is talking about is the process. But man is not cursed. Woman is not cursed. The only things cursed are the serpent and the ground. Note that carefully. All right. Now, God says to the earth that from that time onwards, the, the, there is a curse on the earth. And what is the curse? The curse is that the earth will produce thorns and thistles. So that's what I call the problem. The problem of humanity is thorns and thistles from the earth. Painful and unfruitful outcomes, results in our lives. Thorns and thistles were not in Eden. In Eden, everything produced beautifully, but when Adam and Eve came out of Eden after the fall, then they encountered thorns and thistles. So what God is saying is, Adam, because of what you have done, you're going to move from Eden where everything works to your advantage, where fruit trees come up to your advantage. You just go and eat and you just enjoy the beauty of the earth. Now you're going to another place and in that place, the ground is going to produce things you don't want. And he calls them thorns and thistles. And he says, it's going to be hard on the ground. It's going to be hard. Not that life will be hard, but the ground will be hard. It will be a more difficult environment for you to operate in. The earth will not produce what you want. Eden was planted to feed Adam. But after the fall, God says, you're going into a new situation where thorns and thistles come up. So, if Adam and Eve leave Eden, 
And they go to the place east of Eden. And thorns and thistles. The atmosphere has changed. The earth seems unfriendly to them. The environment is harsh. So how are they going to survive? They can't dress it and keep it because it is not a good shape. You have to grow it before you can even dress it and keep it. In Eden, God has grown it. You just manage it. Outside Eden, you have to grow it yourself before you even manage it. So how is Adam and Eve going to survive? He gave them the way they're going to survive. He gave them the solution to the problem of thorns and thistles. And this is what he said. I love God so much. He says in verse 17, Cursed is the ground for your sake. That's number one. But that's not the end of the sentence. In toil you shall eat of it. Now if you're using the Bible and the Bible is yours underlined, you shall eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. But you will eat of it. How are you going to eat of it? With toil. Verse 19 he says, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. So what is God saying? God is saying the earth will produce thorns and thistles. But if you want to overcome the thorns and thistles and have a fruitful life and, and enjoy life, then you're going to apply toil and sweat. Toil and sweat, therefore, are not a curse. They are God's redemptive plan to redeem us from the thorns and thistles of life. So if life is producing thorns and thistles for you, the way to deal with the thorns and thistles is, is toil and sweat. Now many people have interpreted toil and sweat as a curse. But toil and sweat is not curse. Toil and sweat it's a blessing. It's a redemption. It's God's plan for making, giving us the tools to overcome the hardships of life is through toil and sweat. In Eden, there is no toil and sweat. But outside Eden, because the environment has changed and the earth is hard, God says, Adam, the only way you're going to overcome these stones and thistles from the earth is that you have to be ready to toil and you have to be ready to sweat. In other words, you're going to work exceedingly hard. You're going to sweat. And you will work hard. But when you sweat and work hard, it will not be fruitless. He says you will eat of it. In other words, your hard labor will be blessed. And you will overcome the adversity of the earth because of hard work. So ladies and gentlemen, hard work is your redeemer from poverty. Sweat, toil, giving time, working hard. Because there are some people who believe in sweatless prosperity. It's a nice sounding phrase. But the biblical approach is not sweatless prosperity. It is sweatful prosperity. Before you prosper, you will sweat. And you will toil. So you can't work for two minutes and say, I'm tired. You know, there are people who get tired early morning. They get up in the morning, oh, uh, I'm tired. Uh, what have you done? Nothing. You just slept for eight hours. So as a matter of practice, 
I don't use the phrase, I'm tired in my life. If I, if I feel tired, I will just say, I need rest. But I will never say, I'm tired. Because you can speak tiredness to yourself. And the thing is that if you don't sweat and you don't toil, thorns and thistles will follow you. And I don't know about you, I don't want thorns and thistles in my life. So you have to work and not give yourself excuses to take it easy. People tell you, take it easy, take it easy. Oh, why are you struggling? Why are you struggling? Because there are thorns and thistles. I have to sweat. I have to toil. So I'm recommending sweat and toil to all of you. It is called hustle. You will hustle, but God will bless your hustle. And your hustle will make you overcome the thorns and the thistles of life. Yes, sometimes you'll be disappointed. Sometimes you go through difficulty. Things that you thought will work out will not work out. But how do you overcome that? You're going to toil the more and you're going to sweat the more because that is how you eat. What God is saying is, Adam, hard work is not a curse. Hard work is not a curse. I mean, sometimes we say things like favor, not labor. And, and I like the, the idea. It's a nice phrase. But favor will not stop you from labor. <laughs> you see, favor is open door. But to enter, there will be no suction pressure from the door to vacuum suck you before you realize you've entered. No. God will give you favor. He opens the door, but you must labor to enter. You will labor. You will toil. You will sweat like I'm sweating more than this one. I'm sweating this afternoon. You are sitting there coolly. I'm working. I'm the one working here right now. Look at how I'm sweating. <laughs> Tomorrow you also go and sweat. <laughs> you sweat somewhere. This is my working day. I'm sweating here and you say, amen, amen. Tomorrow you go and toil and sweat and when you are toiling and sweating don't say life is hard just say God is giving me something to eat God is giving me victory over the thorns and the thistles of life this is my redemption sometimes you find a widow woman left with children, three children, four children, five children. It's a common Ghanaian story. And this woman takes the challenge and toil and sweat and toil and sweat and toil and sweat and wake up at dawn and work throughout and work and work and work and work and take the children to school, although she has no education herself. Educates five children, take them to university. And then they all start giving her money and blessing her so she's eating. How did she eat? Toil and sweat. You don't look at them and say, oh, I wish I was like her. Yes, toil and sweat. Where is your sweat? Unfortunately, I've seen a lot of young men who are lazy. Capital L. Capital A, capital Z, capital Y, 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 Y. Lazy. Life whips you a little. Oh, life is hard. It's hard. Oh. Get up and go and work. God said there will be thorns. You will be pricked. 
You will be hurt. You'll be disappointed. You will lose an investment. You may lose something you love. Things may not work out. You may lose a contract. Somebody will sidestep you. But you don't quit and cry. There's no place for tears in this, in this process. It's sweat. Sweat is not tears. Sweat comes from the skin. Tears come from the eye. When you are tearing up, it means your, your eye is finished. You, 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 you've given up. But when you are sweating without tears, it means you are really serious to overcome the challenges of life. May God bless your toil. May he bless your sweat. And don't ever look at the work you are doing and say, oh, I wish I had a better work. Yeah, sometimes it's good to have a better work. But li listen to me. I've lived long enough in this country. I've seen people raise children selling kiloili. I've seen women bake bread. They never went to university and take care of 10 children well educated. And I've seen people with two children who have degrees who couldn't take care of their two children. And I've seen women with no education who sweated and toiled because degree with laziness will not help you. You can, some of you, you pile up the degrees like thermometer. You take pile up, pile up. But you are lazy. Any hardship you give up, Every hardship you give up, you start crying. And go out there. Look at some of the people you see by the roadside. You know, sometimes I see these women by the roadside, I say, wow. And their children, the child is in their back. They're holding the child. Now, when you look at the child, you say, what is the hope for this child? Oh, yeah, there is hope for that child. So far as that woman is going to toil and sweat, that child has a destiny. All of us, our mothers put us in their backs and went to work menial jobs. All of us, not, not all of most of us. If you saw us, you say, ah, who is this? My mother said she, she, used, she used to carry me, she was selling both fruit in her back. And said so the people would look at the son and say, this one is an ugly one. <laughs> This, son, this is your son is an ugly one. <laughs> Look at me. So what I'm saying is, maybe all you are doing is selling buff road. You are selling kinky and fish. You are selling kelewele. But you have to toil and you have to sweat because that is the only way the earth will be fruitful for you. Don't be too eager just to look for a nice job. Just make sure every work you do, you give it your sweat and you give it your toil. And God will bless the work of your hand. According to Dr. Mensa Utabil, God works. So, is hard work a curse or a blessing? The core scripture was taken from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. So, what is work? Work is an activity that requires spiritual, mental, and physical effect. The three dimensions of work are 1. Work is creation, an activity that leads to a finished product. 2. Craftsmanship, an activity that requires skill. 3. Commission, an activity that occupies our time and attention. God created man to work. Work was required in Eden before the fall of man. Work is not a punishment, but it is a blessing to work. The problem of humanity is thorns and thistles. Painful and ungrateful result, toil and sweat are not a case. Thank you so much for your precious time. Please do well to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and share this video with your friends and family members. Also, do not forget to pass through Pastor Mesa Utabel's YouTube channel to watch more of his videos. Stay blessed.